Thank you. I don't know whether you can stay a bit longer. Or whether you have to leave, I don't know. So if you're still with us, there are some other uh, members who would like to ask uh, some more questions. So I'll now give the floor, starting with Madame Yuknevitiene from the EPP. Uh, Mr. Borrell, you put the very right question to us. What else can we do about this? I would like to say some words on that. First, it is time for us to acknowledge that we are at war. Hybrid war has largely replaced conventional wars. Seeing things the way they are is key to a successful re response. And diplomats have a very important role to play. Remember George Kennan, the U.S. diplomat in Moscow 75 years ago? He had the courage to tell the truth about what he saw in Stalinist Soviet Union. His letter defined the policy of containment. What he described then is shockingly similar to what we see in Russia today. And second, Mr. Borelli, you have a historical opportunity to open the eyes to many the truth in Russia today. Your legacy can still be that of a leader that stood up against authoritarian aggression. And third, as the chairman of our committee, Glucksmann, said very well, it is time we acknowledge that dialogue with Kremlin does not work. Putin will not change. Russia will change, but not Putin. And my last point, we need dialogue, as you just uh, mentioned, but uh, we need dialogue and engagement with Russian people. But containment strategy for Putin, this is what we can do about this. Thank you. Merci pour le groupe. Thank you. Thank you for the SND. For the SND, you have the floor. Hello. Mr. Pico, could you please open your camera? Now we can see you. Thank you, sir. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the floor. Mr. High Representative, ongoing pandemic uh, has proven to be a severe challenge not only for our health and security, but one could also argue that there is a pandemic of disinformation. Um, there seems to be a synergy of different disinformation tactics in our neighborhood by third states supported by domestic actors, from donations of medical equipment to ongoing vaccination campaigns. It's obvious that these countries are using pandemic to strengthen their influence in the countries of our strategic importance while fueling distrust towards the European Union. Having in mind these issues, I would like to ask you how to encourage our member states, including the ones that seek stronger EU but are less enthusiastic about enlargement, to push for more engagement in countering disinformation and vaccine misinformation in the Western Balkans, which aims to undermine European Union. My second question is, do you see space for enhancing cooperation on this issue with the new U.S. administration as well as with the United Kingdom? Thank you. Merci, uh, pour... Thank you. The renew, Mr. Ostevicius. Merci. Thank you, Chair. Um, High Representative, uh, in fact, uh, I have two or three points, very concrete ones. Uh, since we liberal democracies are under attack from those who oppose uh, uh, our democracies as well as uh, the open societies, we have to take it as a fight against our way of life. And those countries, I mean, uh, uh, in, a, in a list which we know pretty well. Uh, my question is, I mean, about the better coordination of efforts with U.S. and like-minded countries. I mean, since uh, it's a common information space and our common values. I mean, uh, I would really uh, um, uh, ask your uh, comment in, in this regard. And even more, uh, do you envisage any international measures to be taken as treaties or uh, amendments to the conventions which would uh, enlarge our possibilities to fight this uh, industries of lies? Secondly, 
Um, Mr. Borrell, uh, we do support uh, European Union's uh, common foreign and security missions, which are indeed uh, located in many regions in the world. I mean, to help and assist locals to bring more security. But they are much exposed to the hybrid threats and disinformation. Uh, I think, I mean, it's time uh, to come to support those missions with the special informational dimension in order to strengthen their abilities. And finally, social platforms, those which are more important and sometimes more able and capable than even some national governments. Is there any plan, I mean, to uh, come to, uh, to uh, general terms with those social platforms where the lies would be denied. Thank you. Merci, uh, Thank you very much for the EPP group. Ms. Fitzgerald, you have the floor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, High Representative, for being here with us. I'd like to ask you your views on the evolving relationship with China. Uh, and looking towards the future. On the one hand, we have the investment agreement, and then we also, of course, have our huge concerns about human rights. For example, we've had an Irishman who's been detained, Richard O'Halloran, in China for two years in a dispute between his company and the Chinese authority. He has not been able to get home to see his wife and four young children, but no allegation has ever been levelled against him. And there are huge issues when it comes to the treatment of Uyghurs. So the question is, how do we balance our economic interests with the human rights situation in China? And of course, this feeds into the disinformation question. As we develop closer economic ties, in your view, what safeguards do we have to ensure Chinese disinformation campaigns do not proliferate, particularly with regard to the human rights situation? Thank you again for being here. Merci pour le groupe. Thank you very much for the S&D group, Mr. Sanchez Amor. Gracias, Rafael. El señor Borrell, usted Thank you. Mr. Borrell, you represent the end of the ad diplomatic adolescence of the EU. I think here it was necessary to refer to the language of power. We've already seen the insignificance of Madame Ashton. And we've seen that a situation like that has uh, risks, as we've seen with your latest trip to Moscow. Now, here there are many policies and many attempts. Now, I mentioned one thing, intelligence services. We can't keep living with borrowing from national intelligence services. We, I think we need to uh, our own independent intelligence service, which has to be uh, coordinated with our national intelligence services. We've seen the crisis in the UK when Madam uh, Hewlett was, we, we were not prepared, and today, we are seeing that we're having to still deal. We need these tools because, as a colleague said, our values. It's a question of seeing that our values that have to be uh, attractive to the general population. We've got to teach them democracy. We don't want those societies. We want those societies to use this as an objective. Now, how does these national disinformation campaigns work? Well, we have to strengthen again any types of uh, uh, intelligence service in the EU. Thank you. Before continuing this round of questions, I have to say that the High Representative is going to have to leave us. We've just received an SMS, so I'd like to thank him for making himself available here. I would understand that this conversation isn't closed. I'm sure we'll have another opportunity to continue this discussion. I'd like to thank Mr. Guelner, who's here. Who? Uh, uh, can he answer the questions? Oh, OK. Well, on fera un Okay, well, we'll do a third round. Uh, I do apologise for the other members, but the High Representative will be able to answer this round, but he'll have to leave. So, Mr High Representative, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I'll be quick. I didn't want to leave without giving a few broad brushstrokes to answer, to the, answer these questions. For me. 
mi colega español. Sí, Mr. Sánchez de Amor, mi español colega. You are, you're looking at a very uh, difficult problem, the question of having our intelligence service. We do have an intelligence service, but it does not the capacity to act on in the field. All it does is receive information from the national intelligence services. From that point of view, you can... Uh, uh, question the fact whether it is our own intelligence service because as it gets its information from the national international uh, intelligence services then they process it and give it to the external uh, uh, access service as a compendium and so that's a bit different from having our own real intelligence service with agents in the field in the countries but that's uh, because that is part of the powers of the member states. We don't have this power. And do you know that we are working with the powers we have? We don't have that. But if we need intelligence, the member st states uh, offer, give us this uh, uh, information. But they only give us the intelligence they want to give us. We've got good cooperation with the member states, and I can say that on the whole... I feel that I, I'm very much informed by the intelligence I receive from my service. But you know, we all know that if it's not doesn't come from information on the field, it's recycling and reprocessing a summary of what we receive from the member states. I don't know whether you have an idea of the cost it would be to it would it mean to have our own intelligence service but it's not something we can discuss because we have neither the funds nor the power but we do have information we have intelligence and it comes from the member states your question on the agreement with china and uh, human rights and its relations with disinformation well when you're talking about disinformation you could talk about anything the agreement with investments with China is not a question of disinformation. The chi China is going to pre present it all in the most positive fashion for themselves. Yes, of course, we should not be scandalized by that, that the, that the state propaganda apparatus uh, shows uh, events in the most, uh, in the best way for themselves. But we do, we have to present what we are trying to do. We try to explain it to the international community or the public opinion of these countries. There's agreement with investments. It is multifaceted. It's polyfaceted. You have to discuss it. But I would not consider it a question of disinformation. Disinformation is something else. Uh, explaining the advantage of, of something from one's own best for oneself is normal. What is happening with this information? It's industrializing lies. It's using lies systematically in an organized fashion. That is disinformation. So then this doesn't have anything to do with our investment agreements with China and uh, Europe's uh, relations with China. Mr. Stovicia, if we want to coordinate with the United States, well, Yes, we could, in the functioning of my small tools to combat disinformation, coordination is done when you can and when you need it, but not systematically and not permanently. Do you have an idea of the real dimension our services for combating this have compared to what the United States have. I mean, we're nothing in comparison. So we'll always want to coordinate, yes. But at the moment, I'd just be satisfied if we could strengthen coordination with the member states. I'm sorry, but I have to leave. I have another video conference uh, in a few minutes' time, and I can't spend more time with you. I would have wanted to. Of course, this all remains open, and it's true that it's a war now. It's a. If you Google 
cyber war or disinformation war, you see the quantity of books that have been written and the articles that come out. We've got to learn how to fight this war and we have to get the tools necessary to do this because compared to what our adversaries have, our tools, we are very few, we don't have tools. But if we are aware of the severity of this problem, we will have to be consistent and we will have to equip ourselves with the necessary uh, instruments to do this. I apologize and we can talk about this again some other time, but I do have to leave. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. High Representative. Rest assured, we will find other occasions to try and meet with you and speak with you so we can make some headway. I'm sure there will be many, many questions still that we'd like you to field. Thank you for being available. Thank you for giving some answers there. We will press on uh, with the round of speakers. I'd like to thank Mr. Grelnau for being here to answer your questions. And perhaps, uh, you know, covering some areas that haven't been covered yet. Mr. Kovacev, first of all, for the EPP group. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, sorry that the High Representative uh, went, but uh, from his answer, I understand that at uh, the end of this week uh, there will be a list of uh, uh, people and entities uh, related to the Navalny case on the, on the sanction list. Um, I understand that this is very difficult, the coordination of this within the European Union, the fight against, against disinformation, but at least on the sanction list, uh, uh, for example, uh, sources or entities in the Russian Federation, uh, this so-called Internet Research Agency or the Troll Fabric in St. Petersburg, uh, I'm very interested if uh, uh, the people around this, uh, like the oligarch who is uh, the owner of this, uh, is on our sanction list because it's on the U.S. sanction list and we can much more coordinate. I don't think it's so difficult to coordinate. I don't think, I don't buy this answer. It's very difficult to coordinate with the United States on uh, one common sanction because uh, they have assets uh, uh, in the United States and the Western Europe and we should also uh, motivate uh, like-minded countries, uh, Canada and other uh, like the fight against uh, tax haven to have uh, a common approach uh, if we talk about uh, sanctions on entities and uh, people or uh, physical persons uh, uh, who are related to disinformation campaign against uh, democracy against us uh, European Union that uh, we uh, we uh, we coordinate uh, much more and uh, the second question is uh, about uh, um, istratcom I understand that uh, you cannot uh, or nobody openly can give us exactly numbers and number of uh, um, funding what we are going to do there and the staffing of, uh, uh, of this uh, group. But uh, I will repeat that uh, we, as many of my colleagues as well, would like to see much more uh, that we do in support the idea of Istratcom by en uh, enhancing and uh, making it more effective uh, because from the other side we have a real uh, very coordinated uh, authoritarian regimes uh, far, uh, not only from Russia but China, Saudis and so on uh, which are trying to divide us. Thank you very much. Merci. Uh Thank you, Mr. Andrews, for the Renew Group. You have the floor. Merci, uh, Chairman. Um, I want to ask a question about uh, communications uh, in the vaccines area that the um, HRVP raised in his presentation. Uh, in 2018, uh, the US Journal of Public Health uh, reported findings that more than 90% of vaccination messages on Twitter uh, could be sourced from malicious sources in the period 2014 to 2017. More than 90% were from malicious sources. It demonstrates that even in normal times, vaccinations are an area rich and fertile for disinformation, the spread of disinformation. Um, and it undermines confidence in public health in particular and in governments more generally. Obviously, in a time of pandemic, this is even more serious. Now, at the weekend in Dublin, there were protests. Uh, there were very violent protests in which police were injured. And the protesters claimed that, co uh, that COVID was a hoax. 
that it was gene therapy, uh, a bioweapon. Uh, it's a very small example, but I see these people as victims of weaponization of vaccine skepticism. And just today, Aoife Gallagher from the, strategic, uh, the Institute for Strategic Dialogue concluded that this was a coordinated campaign from the UK. So my question is, the EEAS published special reports, three of them in March and April of 2020. There was another one for the period May to November and then nothing. Now, if we are serious about vaccination being rich and fertile ground for disinformation about vaccinations, then we should be publishing this information regularly. So we have no information from the end of November. And the EAS claimed that it drove so, such an increase in traffic to its website. It increased by 800 percent, Mr. Burrell told the AFET committee at the end of April last year. So maybe there's an innocent explanation, but I'd like to hear it. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Gozi for... Mr. Gozi for Renew, you have the floor. Mr. Gozi, please press the speak button. Can you hear me? Well, thank you, Chairman. Uh, the Chairman, I deplore the fact that the High Representative couldn't stay another five minutes to respond to all the questions, especially as we weren't too happy. Well, he wasn't too convincing with his answers. Uh, personally, I can only state that today, given what he said to us, we've got no powers of dissuasion at the level of the EU. We don't have uh, enough of a budget. Apparently, it's the, uh, the Parliament's fault. But I did not understand whether we could do better, which would be the dissuasion powers that would be useful to have at the level of the EU, well aware of the fact that in coordination with the member states, there was no answer on that. It would be a good idea to go further in depth at this. And there we should have taken these figures. I was in my office. I didn't hear correctly. And what is the situation of the fields and the dialogue between the UN, uh, between NATO and the EU? We've seen that we need to look at the interference of, of uh, powers from all over the world. If we've well understood, it's not just a question of Russia. But if I understand, something happened recently. And I also uh, wondered whether there was, a, was aware of, of uh, interference from other uh, powers. But I would like to be able to speak to him directly next time. Merci. Je tiens à préciser que je ne suis pas maître, évidemment. Well, I have to say that I am not in charge of the High Representative's agenda. Um, he did promise that he would come back. So he did say that. And then we'll have an opportunity to put those questions. In the meantime, uh, short of having the High Representative here, we do have a Mr. Gwynair here, uh, eminent person, uh, you'll have more than just the traditional one minute that we tend to give to guests. Uh, maybe I can put some of the questions again, because it is important for us to be apprised of this. Do you think that in the Kremlin, in Beijing, or elsewhere, the leaders who are authorising these attacks expect to have to pay a high enough price to, for it to be dissuasive in today's world. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, of course, it's always very disappointing to have a, a head of division rather than the high representative. Uh, so I try my best um, and also to answer to the, the remaining questions. And if you allow me, I will start with your question on the, on the costs. Well, I cannot uh, see exactly what is uh, considered in... Uh, uh, in the pro-Kremlin system or in the Chinese system or in any other system how much it costs. But we can state, and I think Ms. Jurova said, said this in this uh, committee very clear, it is very cheap and easy to produce uh, disinformation and disinformation campaigns. And I think we need to work with all the instruments that we have 
and there a couple of them, there's not one magic bullet on this um, to raise these costs. How do we do this? We do this with exposure. We do this with awareness raising campaigns. We do this with clearer rules for uh, social media, uh, for example. Um, I think Mr. Breton has uh, talked about this in, in much more detail. And we speak on the, on the foreign policy side, as we said today, also about new instruments, exactly as the High Representative uh, told you. There is no easy way to construct it because we don't have uh, a clear international norm that we can just kind of use. Uh, but it is exactly this, what we need to do together with you, with this committee, with the member states, to develop such an instrument. Uh, different options, and uh, I think it would be an excellent occasion also to have this exchange with you, maybe in, a, in an in-camera setting or in a, in, a, in a different setting, to reflect uh, jointly on this. But let me come back to the questions that came, um, I think, Mr. Kovacev, asking on the, exactly on this question. Um, Maybe there's a bit of a confusion. The High Representative spoke about the new sanctions regime on human rights uh, that is just being um, now worked on with uh, a certain listing. We have a specific sanctions regime already in place on uh, Ukraine, as you know, uh, where some of these people that are also on the US list are actually listed. So there is already an, an overlap. But it is, uh, it is true, there is no sanctions regime at the moment anywhere in the world that would allow us, because of disinformation, uh, to sanction. And this is exactly what uh, needs to be uh, looked at in terms of possibilities, feasibility, with many, many, um, let's say, questions that are open in terms of attribution, in terms of also clear definition, let's say, what, what is it, you know, legally that we, that we look at. Um, on the staffing, on the exact resources, um, High Representative has said, um, for security reasons, we should do this in a, in a more restricted uh, way, but I would be happy uh, to come to you in an in-camera session to give you detailed figures, uh, detailed uh, numbers as well. Um, but you will understand that also we or I have to, uh, to protect a little bit my own staff on this one. That's why I would uh, appreciate uh, confidentiality. And last but not least, Mr. Andrews, on, uh, um, on the questions of uh, vaccines, uh, the many issues, the many lies, the malicious sources that you refer to, well, that is also to a large degree our assessment that there is a lot of disinformation, but also a lot of misinformation in, in this field. And that's why the Commission on the one hand, but also the External Action Service has made this such an important uh, issue. You asked for the reports. We have actually issued five reports um, uh, on disinformation. You remember that this started in, uh, the, in the beginning of COVID-19. We will continue to do so, but we don't want to stick to very specific deadlines. So every four weeks, uh, because we always said, let's publish when we have the news uh, that are really important, and we will continue to do so. And very last question from Mr. Uh, Godzi. Um, on, I think he asked on, on NATO and also on other players. Well, part of our work is, uh, is to enlarge our, our network and not for the sake of creating a network, but to have better exchange of information, better coordination, and to enable us also to react jointly. Um, and as you discussed in this committee, uh, there are other players, there are emerging players, there are non-state actors, and I think this deserves a very, very, very a uh, close look also. I hope that answers some of these questions. Again, sorry that I cannot uh, fully replace my, uh, my boss, but uh, I'm sure that uh, if you have any additional questions uh, that are imminent, uh, we're happy also to, ask, uh, to answer them in, in writing if that is possible. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Now we have to go through the announcements from the chair because we did have an NJ coordinators moot meeting. I'll do it in English. The met earlier today and decided to table on behalf of the NJ committee not only one but two questions for all response with debate in plenary as set out in Rule 136 of the uh, EP Rules of Procedures. The first question will be submitted before the summer break and it will concern foreign interference, electoral interference and what is the price for foreign interference uh, to be imposed on uh, marine actors. 
The second question will be submitted after the break, uh, and it will concern the regulatory approach to social media platform and building resilience against the spread of disinformation and loopholes in our uh, legislations. Coordinators will work on a draft text to be submitted to the NG committee for a vote. The vote will uh, uh, possibly be scheduled for the committee meeting on 13th of April. After the endorsement of the text of the question, the Conference of Presidents is asked to, to place it in the plenary agenda for the sitting, possibly July for the first question and October for the second one. But let's see. The draft question will be circulated among NJ committee members as soon as it's available. Coordinators have also decided on the upcoming hearing on social media platform before the summer break. The invitations to the concerned platform will be drafted and sent very soon. S'il n'y a pas d'autres demandes sous le point d'hiver, euh, nous passons. If there are no other questions under other business, then we'll move on to the final item on our agenda for today. That is the date of our next meeting in association with the delegation for relations with Belarus, Wednesday, the 3rd of March, at half past one to 3 p.m. Disinformation and inter foreign interference in Belarus. And then on Wednesday, the 17th of March, from 9 till 12 noon, a hearing on online democracy and how we can protect ourselves. Now, with, before you just go off and have a pleasant afternoon, I would like to warmly thank Mr. Borrell, the High Representative, the members present. I would have to offer my apologies for those who didn't have an opportunity to put their questions directly to the High Representative. I'd like to thank the interpreters. We didn't finish late for once. Thank you for their ability and their uh, very kind work. I'd like to thank the Technical Service, the INJ Secretariat. Have a very nice evening. <laughs>